Good evening, everybody. Dr. Glow here with Black Girl Everything for an amazing interview. Because I already know it's going to be amazing. I'm super excited about it. So I'm I'm practicing here. So it's E2 Sana. Eto Chana. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get that. Like I'm gonna get it down fast. And then please. There's different pronunciations. Uh okay. I've heard Tana with a T, Tana, uh -huh. and Chana. So interesting. So interesting. So where did your name come from? Well, the Eto was a name that was given to me by my Congolese peers uh in dance mm -hmm. and music. Um, they gave me that name. Wow, it's over it's over a decade of carrying that name. So first off, the name Eto belongs to a soccer player uh, by the name of Samuel Eto. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, he was considered one of the best uh, players in um in soccer. Okay. From Cameroon. And um, I went over to California to a dance conference and it was time to dance in the circle and do our solos. And then it was my moment and I, I, I went for it. And they started, eto, 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 eto. And I didn't know what they were talking about. I'm like, well, who's, who are you? You're insulting me, what's going on? Uh -huh. And it just turns out that the, the reference is Samuel Eto is, you know, every time he goes out onto the field, you know, he doesn't look intimidating, but he scores. So the reference was that every time I step out, I score. So Eto has just been the, the name, the name for me. And Chana is actually uh, my last name. It means unhappy, although there's nothing unhappy about me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. So where are you from? I was born in New York, uh, mm -hmm. born and raised in New York. I practically lived my whole life in New York until I started traveling out um, in 2008. So I spent okay. a year in Paris uh, studying Congolese dance. And then in 2009, I took myself uh, to the Republic of Congo um, and spent some time there. 2014 took myself to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and spent two years there. Um, but I'm a New Yorker. I'm a Bronx, a Harlem, Spanish Harlem girl. And uh, basically Puerto Rican, African American, you know, um, I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my Puerto Ricans. I love it. My <laughs> wife is actually Puerto Rican and African American as well. Yeah. So I know all so well. So you know, so you know. Yeah, yeah. From the Bronx. So trust me, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We, yeah. out, we are out here. <laughs> yes, everywhere, all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So tell uh, people about your craft, though, because I've seen you in action. And I fell in love with you from just watching. It's like, oh, my gosh, she's so cool. So please tell about everybody about your craft and all your talents, because you do so many different things. Okay, so I want to just rewind a little bit back. I want to first thank you. Thank you for this opportunity for having me, right? I want to thank you viewers for sitting here and watching and getting to know the person that's sitting in and being streamed in front of them. But you and I, we actually met at an event, right? Yes, we did. Um, and it was a fashion show. So I was invited over to come and perform uh, for a, a fashion show, African fashion. It was Yele, to be exact, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Yes, Yale. Fantastic, beautiful designs, beautiful atmosphere. And I came out and I performed what I call Congo beats. Now, there is no real term that's, you know, Congo beats is a term that I am using to refer to musics and sounds that come from the Congos. Mm -hmm. um, we hear the terms Afro beats, we know that. Now we're hearing, you know, musics like, uh, uh, terms like um, uh, I'm a piano and all mm -hmm. these. And I was like, hey, well, we need a term for, for Congo music. I need, me, I need mm -hmm. here in the diaspora a term because we are all about terminology here, right? Yeah. Uh, knowing where things are from. So to bring clarity to what I was doing, 
I said, hey, um, my music is coming from the Congo. It's heavily Congo influenced. It's also very Caribbean, Puerto Rican influenced uh, because I'm bringing in, you know, my experiences. Uh, it has the African American essence. Um, I'm gonna call it Congo beats. And that's mm -hmm. uh, the term that I've been using. Uh, there's other terms. Um, for Congolese styles of music, but it depends on the genre of what people are doing. But for me, it is definitely Congo beats. My my um, my lyrics are usually in Lingala in English. There is a mixture of Spanish um, uh, language uh, mixed in there. And most recently, I spent almost a full year, almost a year, almost hit that year in Tanzania where I started you know, touching and, and, you know, playing and really digging in with uh, bongo flavor music and um, some Tanzanian ama piano, some East African ama piano. Um, so that's a little bit about my music creation. I started creating music in 2017, but I've been a dancer for a very, very long time, uh, growing up here in New York with our West African, our, our Caribbean dances. Uh, I mean, and if, if you ask me, one of the, the first trainings that we had here, um, wow, for me, it was definitely hip hop, the term hip hop, um, of course the reggae, patra, you know, and, and those type of, you know, uh, uh, artists and musics that were very much influencing us here. I'll never go wrong with salsa merengue because it was, it was part of the culture, especially here yeah. in New York City. Um, so dancer first, choreographer. Then in 2017, uh, you know, to, to, to really broaden what I was doing and open up different avenues, I started doing music. Now the question has been, oh, are you a singer? So if I would have probably been a singer first, I would really... Yes, I'm a singer, but I've mm -hmm. always been a dancer as far back as I can remember from the times my mom would teach me the one, two step and I would cry because I didn't want to do it. I did not want to dance. Really? I did not want to dance. And my mom was like, one, two, one, two. I mean, it was like that Debbie Allen would stick kind of a deal. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. My mom is uh, she's a magnificent uh, dancer. Um, and even now, so trying to teach me the hustle, I'm like, Ma, I don't know. <laughs> ask me today, I want to learn the hustle. I'm like, Ma, can you, do you remember when you were trying to teach me that back then? Can you come back to that? Yeah. Um, I went and did my undergrad in drama, theater, and dance. Oh, wow. Uh, in New York City, I, I danced with a few uh, professional dance companies. Mm -hmm. uh, Movement for the Urban Village. I danced, uh, did a production with Vissy Dance Theater. Uh, did a was part of a, a dance theater company called Liberata Dance Theater. And then in 2010, I created my own dance company called Mabina Dancers. So th there's definitely a history of you know of my dancing, whether um, it was hip hop, whether it was Afro contemporary dance, whether traditional African dance, uh, because that was another thing that we were very much exposed to was West African, traditional West African dance. And then when I stepped into Central African dance, that's when my my career took a different path. So that's a little bit about my craft and what I do. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing little bit about that. There's so many different parts. It, it raised so many different questions for me. Um, I think one of my major interests for you is when I saw you at the fashion show, I felt that fashion show was a lot of lessons for me in regards to culture and different things that I've, I've mentioned. So please explain to me, because you mentioned that there's two Congos. I would have had no clue. Can you kind of like educate me and my viewers on what that actually means? Okay. So when I'm talking, all right. I actually also, I'm an adjunct lecturer at Hunter uh, College. Uh, so, <laughs> and um, I am specifically, um, you know, 
talking about Central African dance. Uh, New York City and the U.S. in general has a heavy West African influence, and we're we're dating back uh, West African dance coming to the United States. Woo! Um, years, years, years ago. Um, over a hundred years ago, and I'm not talking. Okay just through slavery but an actual you know and uh an artist from sierra leone coming over here and actually performing and bringing a ballet which is what is called uh to the united states and performing but that's on that uh history uh quick little boop um but central uh Af central africa when i'm talking about the congos i'm talking about the democratic republic of the congo which used to be called Zaire, and I'm talking about the Republic of the Congo. Um, what separates them is the river. The, uh -huh. uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the bigger of the two. Um, and um, both countries speak Lingala um, as an official language, as well as each ethnic group speaks their own dialect as well. Um, two different presidents. Uh, oh, really? oh yes, and what what really separates them now? That we're coming to a point in 2020, you know, to that all Congolese are saying, "Hey, we're 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 coming together. We're together. We're one people." Right? Yeah. Uh, what separates them is colonization and who colonized who. France, mm -hmm. France took colonized the Republic of the Congo, and the Belgium re uh, colonized the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So. Those are the differences um, and is in Central Africa. But I want to take a step back because um, I held this conversation today with my students about um, our Haitians and Cubans and, and Puerto Ricans and everyone else who talks about having any kind of ancestry, Jamaicans and, you know, anyone yeah. from the Caribbeans, you know, um, and it's not, it just doesn't stay in the Caribbean, but um who have who have lineage and who talk about having culture that's Congo. And you'll hear people say, oh, this comes from the Congo, or Palo, and this and mm -hmm. that. Things coming from the Congo. And then, you know, now here I'm teaching and they're like, hey, but uh, we just did, you know, uh, Yanvalu with Professor Maxine. And, you know, there's a little difference in what's happening. So I, I went into a little history of explaining, you know, that when we talk about Congo, we're not just specifically, we're not talking about the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We're not talking about the Republic of the Congo. Before colonization, there was the Congo Kingdom. So mm. that's very important to know that the people in Central, what was Central Africa, were one people. Um, so uh, during slavery, when people were taken, I believe it was 54% of Central Africans were taken and this wow. over to the Caribbeans and you know the Americas. Mm -hmm. We're talking about those people were brought over and the culture was Congo, but we're yeah. talking about Congo Kingdom. It could have been Cameroon specifically. It could have been you know what I mean? so um I think is when people say hey um this is Congo but doesn't look like the Congo that you're doing it's yeah. because of modernization, right? Mm -hmm. These were still able to, who are in Congo, were still able to, you know, develop their crafts and still perform and hold down to African folkloric uh, themes and dances and meanings where everyone else, like the rest of us, mm -hmm. we just held on to the aesthetic and whatever else was mixed with, uh, with our experience, with who we are. So I, th I went into history, didn't I? <laughs> I am so fine with that. Because like I said, when I met you at the um, at the fashion show, I was like, first of all, I just met, I learned so much about the culture because, you know, being here brought up in New York and, and I actually have not, I've yet to visit the continent of Africa. You don't really understand the diversity within the space because like everybody's like, oh, I'm going to Africa. It's not that. There's so many different places and so much to investigate and so much to learn about. So I felt from that experience from the three, four hours that I was there, I was like, oh my gosh, I learned so much about the culture, about different dance and different sound. Mm -hmm. And it was so exciting to be within that space because I'm like, oh, this is deep. Yes. This is deep. Which is why I was so excited to speak to you because I know you spent so much time on the continent itself. 
So you're definitely cultured. It's funny because I was also mentioning that it will take me, I don't know how many lifetimes. Like So when I speak, I would never say I'm a master. I, I say I specialize. Um, hmm. When I say I specialize, it's really for many reasons. Because like I said, even when I go to the Congo that I'm dancing with the ballet, what we're doing in the ballet, a ballet is a company um, that does performances. And there's a difference between what ballet does and what you'll find in the village happening with people in the village. Let's say that mm -hmm. you hold down to old practices. Um, um, I am not sacrificing anything on stage. You know, I'm not doing any rituals on stage when I'm doing mm -hmm. dances. I am performing. So, you know, sometimes I know that we're we're searching and, and we're hunting. Um, what got me to the Congo wasn't, it wasn't that I was there to research anyone or anything. I just wanted to learn more about the dance, right? That I felt mm -hmm. connected with it. I was like, wait, this is part of me. This is already, I could, I could sense it. I could see it, that I'm connected to this, um, that, you know, I have ancestry in this. And I was doing African dance. And for me, I needed to go to the source. It was important to go to the source. Yeah. Uh, and learning these differences and me coming back. And when I say, hey, I, I teach traditional. I, I can't say that I'm a master at it because if you ask me if I know any dance that's uh, so-called uh, cleansing dance for getting rid of spirits or mm -hmm. you know, uh, fertility dances, no, I don't. Um, yeah. I know a different kind of performance and it's what is done in our ballets. Now, is it traditional in its way? Yes, because we've been doing it this way for, I have elders that mm -hmm. are in the 70s that are doing the same thing that I'm doing. So it is a form of tradition of our folklore yeah. stemming from that. Um, but it took years and years of going back, uh, learning, mm -hmm. asking questions. Mm -hmm. Researching, I, I actually try to take you away from my books, but my books are there. Um, yeah. I'm constantly reading. Uh, I, I see some certain things online, and when I hear people talk, I, I, it makes me do this because I understand we want to inform our uh, the people that are consuming right now, right? Because Africa is on the map. It's always been on the map. but It is the map. It, it, thank you very much. Say it again, please. <laughs> you know, um, but the, you know, everyone's eye is uh, looking and trying to pick up what's new because it's, you know, it, it's, it's fun. It's stylish. It's marketable. Um, but there's a lot of misinformation and people don't want to read and people don't want to do the research. They put out there what they think people want to hear, right? Yeah. And that's kind of how I learned traditional African dances here in the U.S. too. Um, because teachers wanted to give what they thought we wanted, right? Yeah. And when you go back to the source, you're like, wait a minute, that's, that's not accurate. Like, what was going on? Why did you? Well, because their information was also, mm -hmm. we all have somehow, some way, some limited information. But if you're not doing your research, if you're not taking responsibility and documenting your own history and you keep allowing others to do it for you, yep. that information is never accurate and is never there for those that come after. No, I think that's a great thought. I think that we all need to take charge in creating our story and stop allowing the world to dictate what our story is because the story is never the truth. It's never our version of it or anything really remotely close to what it even looks like. So you also mentioned that you have a dance company. What brought you apart starting your own dance company? Oh, wow. So the dance company, this started in 2010. Uh, it, I believe it started when artists were coming to the U.S. and they wanted more than, oh, we want Eto. And Eto, can you bring some dancers? Yeah. And I was like, where am I getting these dancers from? Um, uh -huh especially that my focus during that time when it came to dance, although I did do traditional, but it was mainly in the Afro-contemporary. 
I um, and when I'm talking about Afro contemporary, I'm talking about companies that you could find. A good example would be like uh, Ron Brown's uh, company Evidence, right? Uh -huh. uh, uh, Camille Camille Brown, um, uh, Alvin Ailey, right? All these companies that have that Afro base, but also has different styles mixed in. Uh, whether it's um, modern, a little ballet, a little jazz. So my focus was more, ooh, I want that. And then all of a sudden when these artists started coming in from Sierra Leone, from the Congos, and they're coming with their bands and there's festivals all over the place, this was it. This was the opportunity that I was looking for. I was getting performances, able to go out there and showcase at that time the Congolese dance that I that uh, I had gained, but as the demands grew, as things started shifting, I think the shift happened when Afrobeats really came over into the U.S. Yeah. And, you know, uh, now people, okay, yeah, the traditional was fun. Can you do Afrobeats? And it was like, oh man, wait, let me see what I can find on YouTube. Yeah. Let me see, uh, who were the, the, the dancers that, became very popular on um in in London Britain's got talent um the CEO dancers right so let me go look at the CEO dancers and see what they got going on there and I'm looking I'm like eh okay I could create something from my understanding uh and that's kind of how it started going it started traditional a little less and more focus on the popular styles of you know of afro dances which could have been ivory coast coupe de calais it could mm -hmm. have been the dombolo or sukus coming from the from the congos it could have even been afro beats coming from ghana or nigeria mm -hmm. and some Azonto and you know anything of that sort and yeah you're just saying a whole bunch of stuff and i was like i don't know what any of that means <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean when we're talking about man you know i this, i was talking today i said look how many countries you're talking about on the continent and to that we're just and i'm just naming what seems to be the most popular and this is what i said what seems to be the most yeah. popular on the mainstream and you know there's been so much talk about the term you know is this afro dance is this uh urban dance because if you speak to someone french they say oh i, I dance la danse urbaine you know i dance urban dance um and it, what does urban mean and but after now that you know and, and i reserved myself from commenting a little bit i'm like i don't know even the term afro dance because it reminds me of the term african dance gotcha what does that mean um yeah. And now I'm starting as I read, and I'm mm -hmm. reading some, some things, some some great writings from Robert Ferris Thompson, from Brenda Dixon Godchild. The wording that's being used is popular music, mm -hmm. and I'm like, ah, okay, popular music, and the and popular music that will change with time because I mean even in the Congo, the musics have changed from the. 50s to 60s to the 90s to what's happening now but popular music seems to make sense to me it's different than traditional mm -hmm. you know it's different than you know the contemporary where you know someone with their guitar singing um so yeah that's a little bit uh, a, a whole lot it's a whole lot when we're talking about how complex africa is culturally uh artistically in so many ways very complex and very it's big yeah can't one small little and it's it's very yeah. hard to, to to really understand if you don't get out there and if you're not doing some research no it's definitely amazing so you have so many different things going on right as an artist a dancer, a pure creator in all aspects, even as an educator, which I didn't know that part, by the way. Like you have all these different things. You're just constantly feeding the world, you, 
which comes with so much, right? So how many languages do you actually speak? Uh, three. Okay. Um, and I, I do not have a bad understanding of Lingala. So, um, and it's a language, it's uh, the official language of uh, the Congo. Um, and it was, for me, that was important. I, I forget which professor I met. Um, I, I, I was taking uh, my graduate studies at NYU and the professor had said, uh, maybe his name escapes me for the moment for now, that's okay. But he had said, um, everyone wants to be African-American, but no one who's African-American, he was like, and very few have actually stepped you know, on the land. He also went on to say, a very few have taken out to the time to learn a language. Very few have taken out the time to learn about the culture. So if you didn't do those things, how are you African American? And I remember sitting there feeling vexed, <clears throat> you know? This was back in 2008. I was like, what? How dare you? <laughs> And now we fast forward and I'm like, huh, I could get it. I understand it. Um, it's not enough just to, I guess, to say, you know, we have lineage and our bloodline, our DNA, but it's like, in a way is like, how are you investing yourself back into where you come from? How important is that for you? Um, and for me, it was very important. See, now I'm an overachiever, okay? <laughs> Hands down overachiever. Now I was like, okay, now what language I got to learn now? How much <laughs> more research do I need to do now? Because it's true, though. Like, I feel like I'm called out a little bit. When you were called out in 2008, you repeated that. Now I'm called out in 2022. Because how much real effort have I really put in? Yes, I was an FM studies major in, in college. And I did all that. So I had that. But that was very fluffy. It was in Temple University. It was fluff, right? It really didn't investigate or really get into stuff. So now I have a new project. Thank you. You know, and... It's a, I think for me, it's, um, it's, it's, it's ongoing education, right? Because yeah. we never stop. Um, but even if it's like, okay, hey, you can't get yourself there for whatever reason that might be, you can't get yourself there, but it's connecting in some form or it, it I mean, certain things are just at our fingertip. The way we could look up and see TikTok videos and start copying things that we see, maybe going a little deeper that information is there yeah. um so it, it's very funny because um um as a female artist so I, I was recently told something and it made me think about do i have the right mm -hmm. um because when i in a lot of countries i've been to four countries uh and there's this theme of being called white now, don't let that bright light fool you, okay? <laughs> I'm be kind of pale, but, you know, I'm a light, you know, little coffee with cream, you know, a little honey on the side. Um, but I'm a black woman. I never grew up here in America thinking anything different. Uh, I remember um, having my moments of, hey, can you not wear your hair like that because you look too black? That was at a, a previous job. And I was like, what do you mean wear my hair like that? Yeah, because you have it in the Afro. Can you, you know, so this would be perfect for corporate America. Like, you know, yes. keep it down, slick it back, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And and then the, the things we needed or that we felt we needed to do in order to, you know, hold certain jobs in certain positions. Uh, so to go back uh, and be called a white woman to me was like, it made me cringe. Um <laughs> Because I never, and it's not because I hold anything against anyone um, who is lighter than me or who mm -hmm. might. Mm -hmm. It's just that I never grew up with those privileges. Mm. I, in, the, you know, in Harlem and in the South Bronx, in a time where, you know, there were gunshots being, you know, all over the place. And my, yeah. I saw friends die, and I saw friends of mine you know, drop out of school, teenage pregnancy. I mean, 
I that's the era I was growing up in, and it's no different than some kids right now. Um, they grew up in, in the yeah. hood, so to go back and it's like oh. And I understand the idea, well, you're coming from where you're coming from. That means you could get yourself here. That means you have some kind of wealth. And, mm -hmm. and I get that notion, right? That, that notion of, oh, well, you're able to travel, which means you have something. But you're also able to travel because you're white. You have privilege. Look how we're gonna, you're going to get treated here. Doors are going to open up for you. And, and there is a complexity with that, um, you know, that idea of... Okay, well, here's Eto. She's light skinned. She's white, so that's why we're paying attention to her. And um, you know, and I've seen uh, instances where white women are getting more clout and more love doing Afro rooted dances. You know, um, and then when it comes to us brown and blacks, it's not that important, right? It, it's like ah, okay. Another black girl dancing, another, okay, we get it. But the, the white woman dances, is like, wow, yeah, and it's going, you know, left and right and viral and this and that. Um, so I, I'm seeing things from two different lenses, and, and it's quite confusing for me. It's, it's, it's a challenging for me, um, you know, because I could never really I, I think of the idea of, well, they think I'm white here, so let me act like I'm white. Because it's not my upbringing it's not who i it's it's no yeah. way to pretend to be something that i'm not you know in a in a place where people think i'm something else other than what you know i'm a black woman uh, it, it is what it is uh, but then to come back here and then see these complexities of what i see of how you know um you know some are favored and what's interesting to watch i mean i've been tagged on white women's videos saying ito is this you i'm like what that woman is blonde Ooh. like like did you look at her profile and i'm like stop tagging me in every white woman's video who could dance i mean wow. <laughs> like stop it <laughs> You know, and I get offended and it's like, man, this woman that, you know, oh, who does she think she is? She's a white woman and she's getting all upset. No, I'm not white. And yes, I'm getting upset. I want to be seen for, for the woman who does her craft and who really invested time um, in what I'm doing. I, I There is no YouTube learning for me. There's been no looking at other people's videos and copying people's steps. I've trained with people who are trained and yeah. have I come from that school. I'm not going to other students to learn, although mm -hmm. we learn from each other. But for the in-depth knowledge that I am trying to seek, I went to elders. So I'm trying not to make any disconnects. I'm, I, I'm trying to really, you know, elevate my craft and and really, when we think about leaving legacies, I want to be written about. I want to be your Catherine Dunham of Congolese dance. I want to be that Josephine Baker that what oops, let's go into this history book. I, I see right now I saw in one of the books I have, I saw Ron Brown's name in there, Camille Brown. I mm -hmm. want Eto Chana. Mm -hmm. I want to leave something impactful. Something where people are like, okay, we can this is a, a resource. She was a resource. She was someone who was pushing boundaries. Someone who was born in the Americas and came back home. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Came back home and did something here. Uh, she came, she she learned, but she also gave. And yeah. not going over there as a culture vulture, but an exchange. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a little bit of what I what I stand for and what I believe in, and a little bit about my journey in the arts. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely definitely cool. So where do you see? So I see your vision, right, about being leaving a legacy, right, right. and a connection right. between here and there and who you are, and and putting your stamp on the world. So for other people, especially Black women or young Black women who are looking for starting their businesses and working on their brands. Um, you kept on mentioning this this part for me. I always talk to people about mastering your your brand, your art, or whatever that is. So, how important do you think it is to truly invest in your brand by 
backing it with real connection to the real world. Mm, that's actually very important. And, and I remember um, um, talking with a friend. When I started doing music, for some reason, people felt that my branding became confusing. Um, because there was something about uh, separating the dancer uh -huh. and the musician. Um, for some reason, the idea of singing was like, Hey, you better just focus on that singing, concentrate all your efforts on your singing, the way you did with your dancing, um, and just focus on singing. And I'm like, well, I, I, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Um, but why can't my branding be both? Yeah. When I'm called to do a show, if my budget allows for it, I'm bringing like my dancers. I'm bringing costuming ideas. I'm bringing the creativity. We're working on ins and outs. I'm putting together production. And then I started removing that term uh, I, that I'm a singer or a dancer. I started using the term, I'm a performing artist. Uh, I wanted people to understand that, that when you're getting me, you're getting a production, whether it, you, there's video, Mm -hmm. uh, whether there's um, there's dancing, there's singing, there's engagement, interaction, because there are certain elements that I keep that are part of you know um, traditional that traditional aspect. Um, so you know, branding is important. Uh, doing your research and and having. Um, you know, the right connections, the right people that can help mentor you. Um, this mentorship is very important. You can't yeah. take everyone's suggestion. However, you know, you can listen to the things that have, uh, are in linked with your, with your vision and what you would like to do. I mean, I remember sitting down, creating a vision board. What did my dance company look like? What was the purpose of the dance company? Uh, what was the message every time we we, we stepped out there? Um, even now, as a musical artist, what's my purpose out there? Now, everything doesn't have to be, you know, this this thesis or this uh, this big problem or social issue that you want to tackle. It could be art for art's sake, right? It could be yeah. performance for love, mm -hmm. because you can. Um, but I think, um, branding is important, getting the right connections, trying to meet the right people. I know that in African entertainment, um, and even from what I've been researching, um, in the Caribbean entertainment, it is not easy. Um, but trying to connect with those and looking at, if you could dig a little deeper and see those that were successful, what made them successful, right? You Sometimes there are positive things that made people successful and sometimes mm -hmm. there are things that you're like, oh no, I'm not willing to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. Um, because there are uh, a lot of things, different things. All press, they said to me, all press is good press. Now, mm, that depends on the individual. I, I remember I was told, I deal with a lot of conflicts as a woman in the, uh, in the entertainment industry because I have people that say to me, well, it's all, you know, if you do this, you'll have more success. And I'm like, whoa, I'm a grown woman. We're not dangling carrots here. Yeah. If it's meant for me, nothing is going to stop it. Yeah. If it's meant for me, mm -hmm. I will continue on uh, you know not banging down doors i will continue doing what i have to do on in my way now it might take me slower to get there but the, the turtle will get there <laughs> I will, yeah it, i will get there uh so you know there's uh there's the positives um there's the negatives and it's one of the things that I, I'm actually writing about uh, for my thesis, having to do with women in the entertainment uh, at the intersection of race, culture, ageism, and sex. Ooh, that sounds exciting. Oh, and, and, and you know, I've gotten a little, I could sense a little bit already the, the, the backlash 
because he's like, hey, wait a minute, Ito, we let you in and now you're writing about us? I'm like, uh, no, I'm not writing about a people. I'm writing about systems that are in place when it comes to entertainment and women. And that's yeah. what you find this in Africa, you find it in the Caribbean, you find it in the USA, you find it everywhere. Mm -hmm. I am, but I'm coming from the lens also as the performing artist who has experienced some of these things. So at the end of the day, I, my purpose, my branding is about women empowerment. It's about, um, you know, combating some of the things that I didn't, I never even thought about before, but have come my way. And, mm -hmm. uh, and pushing that, pushing that narrative, uh, and staying true to that. So that's a little bit about my branding. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because a lot of people look at me because I do so many different things. They're like, well, how do you do these things and do them well? I say, because black women are very powerful. We're the center of the universe and we can do it all. We don't have to focus just one space because we can bring it all together and just be who we are and our greatness. And I like, I'm also a coach. So I work with a lot of businesses and entrepreneurs and on their, I should basically on life and people always get stuck in, oh, I'm going to focus on this one thing. What do you mean? Give me your list of 100 things and let's figure out how they all actually intertwine because they're all part of you. And if you give everything your energy, you're going to be the best person you can be and you realize how much more you can get accomplished. So I found that really interesting, even for you, as I'm digging through this interview with you, I'm finding that you're doing so many more things I wasn't even aware of and all of them are coming across well, you know, because you're living at your highest height. You're not small, you're big, and you're being the big person that you can be, which is a black woman because we're amazing. Yes, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely a reason. That's definitely a reason. And, you know, and then also your second thing about, you know, networking and, you know, collaborating with individuals. That's why I have this thing called the collective with Black or Everything, where we engage and share ideas and you know, we work together. We promote each other's brands and we talk to each other and all that other stuff because it's not a competition. Correct. It does not matter. We right. are all important. And if we're pushing each other, then no one can fail. Right? That's right. And sometimes I feel that's where I, I think I, I was told, uh, you're in the barrel, Eto. We need to take you out the barrel. So, you know, the idea of a bunch of crabs in the barrel. Yep. Um, and I think that barrel is psychological. Very much so. Um, and, I, and I'll say, especially when it comes to entertainment, we all feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I need to be the best or I need to backstab this one or I'm going to use my, I need to backstab it all. I need to tell people that, you know, it all was not born in, in, in Congo. She mm -hmm. has no right. I have the parent, one parent from Congo, but I was born in, you know, this is me creating stories. Uh, but needless to say, these things are splitting hairs is because we're a bunch of crabs in the barrel, not yeah. realizing that the plate is big enough for all of us to eat. When I was in uh, Paris, I lived with a Malian family. And um, what was interesting about that, and, well, there were so many beautiful, interesting things culturally, but one of the most interesting things was when we sat down to eat. Um, they would bring out this huge, big plate. Everyone washed their hands, and we all just ate. There were mm -hmm. no separate plates, um, at least for this family. No separate plates, no separate forks or this or that. We all ate from that same plate, and there was enough for all of us to be satisfied. Yeah. And I think that if we started thinking, like you said, supporting each other a little bit more and truly meaning supporting, because you have to genuinely want to support. You can't say, I support you. And then when that person is like, hey, I need you. And you're like, oh, well, good luck. You yeah. know, what does it really mean to grow together? And, and I think this is one of the things that's lacking in our industry, in our music industry, in our entertainment industry. And I'm specifically talking about our African or, you know, is that um, that idea of moving together. One of the beautiful things I saw in Tanzania 
was diamond platinum. So and he's one example. Diamond Platinum's um, huge artist uh, in East Africa, but he's from Tanzania. He he started a, a record label, and, and and it's his mind that I can admire that 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 business mindset. That yes, I have talent. Yes, I know how to do this. Yes, I can entertain. Yes, I can sell music. Yes, I could perform. But I also have this in mind. I'm creating a label, and under my label, I'm putting Zuchu, I'm putting Bosso, I'm putting Ravani, I'm putting this one. He put his people on. Mm. When his people were pushed and taken to a certain level, they opened up their own labels and put artists under them. Mm. Exactly. When I saw that, I'm like, whoa. Why isn't that mentality being spread just across for yeah. all black folks to mirror? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not talking about the little, some would argue, well, hip hop, we have that, we have the East Coast, you know, we have you deaf, you know, deaf, right? That death row, we have, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about clicks. Yes, because yes, we, we rolled together. Mm hmm. But at the end of the day, we saw a lot of losses and things that actually happened, you know, and when those, you know, those, uh, you know, connections were being made. I don't know if they were really being made like, hey, if I eat from this plate, you eat from this plate too, we eat together. And it's one of the beautiful things, like I said, that I'm seeing in Tanzania. Ravani has his own uh, label. Um, harmonize has his own label and these were people that were all working together and growing together and i would love to see that kind of movement you know like in congo we one of our biggest artists fali ipupa you know fali ipupa he's up there right huh? so who else are you bringing along with you what female artists not just one but what others are you giving chances to who are you yeah, and it might it might be well. Look, I, I'm busy with my own career. I, I gotta keep staying up on top. You can't you can't slip or or sleep in, in these days because one minute boom, you, you you know. But there is something. There is a structure that is working very well um, in Tanzania with the younger generation of artists that you know a lot of us could mirror and really just support each other. Because guess what? If we're thinking about a chain. And creating a chain and power structure. If Eto makes it and I put you on with me, you make it that generates money more money for you, that generates more money for me, mm -hmm. generates money for the enterprise. Then when you go off and do your thing, you bring someone under you, you're generating money for that person, that person's generating money for you. It's just, it's really um, a way of. Not, I don't want to use the word controlling the market, but owning it together. And I really love to see, you know, the time or when we're really like, hey, we support each other. Like, good example, if Ito has a show, I know everyone needs to be paid. But if you're not at the level of what I need for what I'm looking for, and just because you think you have a million followers that you deserve $500, for one song, it's like, come on now, let's be let's be realistic. I have to yeah. stop, I have to train you, I have to prepare you, and then you want me to pay you just because you have a million followers. Like, give me a damn break. Um, <laughs> those followers don't equal, you know, actual knowledge. And this yeah. is, I'm a dancer, so I'm looking at people like, I'm giving them the side eye, like, come on now. Uh, like, who are you fooling, you, you know? Um, the fake it till you make it, I can already see it. So let's just be real with each other and really working with each other to support yeah. each other. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. That's so cool. I, I let's see, you dropping gems and I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But, um, so how, if people wanted to get in contact with you, so like, what do you have going on? I know I noticed on your social media that you're doing dance classes um, so talk a little bit about that. So people actually gain access to you, like, or do you have shows coming up? Like what's going on? Okay. So I actually teach at Kumbe, uh, restoration It's um, and that's, uh, it's on restoration 
1368 Restoration Plaza. So I teach Congolese dance there every Saturday. For the month of April, we, we took a break. We're coming back very strong the month of May um, because we're reorganizing how I'm, what I'm teaching, when I'm teaching it. So the idea is that every week there's a new uh, style in Congolese uh, dance that I'm focusing on. So instead of it just being, okay, you're coming to a Congolese dance class, but you don't really know what you're doing, you would know uh -huh. the first Saturday you're coming to a traditional Congolese dance class with live drumming. On the second week, you're gonna come and you're doing sukus. On the third week, you're doing dombolo. So it's, you know, and then the last week, you're probably doing like an Afro-Congo mix. So you know, it's to bring more uh, awareness to the culture when I'm sharing it. Uh, mm -hmm. And also for people who wanna specialize in certain things. So that's going to be every Saturday uh, starting in May at Kumbe. Um, and um, I am also, uh, I could be, as far as social media, I could be found as Eto Chana, that's E-T-O-O-T-S-A-N-A. -A. Um, some exciting news, I, I actually am a brand ambassador for Ms. Mac Marketing and Sapphire Magazine. So for the oh. month, listen, I was so excited. <laughs> um, uh, for the month of March, I am on the cover of that uh, magazine. So it's a Sapphire Emerald um, magazine, and it can be found online and, you know, just read through. Um, the digital copies are there. Um, so I have that happening. I also, um, I'm also in another magazine, which I could share that information with you. Um, what else is going on? I do have a few performances coming up. I have a performance uh this sunday it's a birthday big birthday bash happening um at the rl the rl hotel where we actually okay. brooklyn so, oh we're celebrating christian's birthday really so, yes it's his birthday so you have to come down you have to come down it's starting at 3 p.m so i'm awesome. gonna Yes, on Sunday, Easter Sunday. So yes, we're gonna do. We're gonna have a nice little time there. And um, wow, I'm gonna enjoy spring break. <laughs> Take the moment to woosa and relax. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a, a few things coming up. Um, some out of country, uh, but you know, if you follow me on social media on Instagram. Everything will be posted there. Um, so yeah, that's Eto Chan again. E T O O T S A N A. Eto Chan. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for spending your time with me this evening. Um, it's been amazing. I learned so much about you and your brand, and whew, so much information. I'm excited. I'm gonna rewatch this interview because that's gonna be on my YouTube channel, Black Girl Everything, so people can have access to it um, forever. And um, just to learn about you and what's going on and just to take heed of some of the things that you share with us today. Because it was definitely magical. A lot of the information that you gave out. And um, I know I, I learned like 5,000 new things today. It was heavy. It was heavy, right? Heavy content thrown at you. But if you have, if anyone has any questions, any interest in knowing more about the Congos, about knowing about Tanzania, if you're interested in going to a trip, I know who are the people where you will have the most amazing time, culturally enriching, um, and learn music and, and, and dance in the Congos, as well as in Tanzania. Um, you could reach out to me, um, DM me. I know who the people are. Um, if you just want to take classes with me, or if you want references on you know, any other Afro-rooted dances, uh, like Afro dance, whether it's your Afro beads, your, your, your Central African your dance forms, South Africa, you can also DM me and I have those resources. So I'm willing to give if you are willing to receive. That's so cool. <laughs> it is because I love learning. So I'm like, ooh, what can I learn now? What can I absorb now? keep my brain going in a whole new direction. I'm so excited about it. But again, thank you so much for your time this evening. It was amazing. Thank you for sharing and thank you for being you. 
thank you thank you for having me um thank you for everyone who was watching and you know who might just dm me like hey it you know you talk too much but i appreciate you <laughs> i was excited you have a lot to say you don't talk too much you just have a lot of knowledge a lot of words but in words that make sense right right just going on and on and on like some people just go on and on i'm like what <laughs> but no, you make sense. So you're okay. You know, it's funny. You know, uh, I, I'm just very happy to share. I was happy to be here. And, um, you know, once again, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm so glad that we, that day when we met, that we stopped and we chatted. Uh, I know that you have uh, something coming up in May, right? Yeah, the 21st. It's the uh, Black Women in Music. My Black Women in Music event. Very excited about it. Yeah, fantabulous. So oh, yeah, uh, the best with all the preparations when it comes to that. Um, yeah, we're pretty much set. Like, I'm. It's gonna be dope. It's gonna be dope. Oh, I'm looking for performances all day long. We have like 24 vendors. Yeah, the whole vibe with an art bar. It's gonna be, ugh, okay. And listen, my friend will be back from Tanzania. So, Curious on Tanzania, if you need anything there, look it up. I'll send you the link. So, if you need any assistance when it comes to some East African representation, I got you. I feel you. I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Until we speak again. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me again. All right. Good night. Good night. <laughs>